National Game Developers Association. We have three talks the fourth Monday of every month. Uh, if you want more details on talks and just our calendar, you can check out our website. It's ig.seattle.org. We don't require membership to come to our talks, but if you get a membership that helps us out, they give kickbacks to us. That gives us money to make these meetings better for you. You also get access to the Career Center, a resource library. There's discounts for GPC and Unity and a bunch of other perks. In terms of next events, we have a picnic coming up on August 12th at Magnuson Park. It starts at 4 p.m. And our next talk is on August 27th at Wizards of the Coast. In the talk today, we'll be discussing Will's approach to conveying the World War II setting respectfully while matching the franchise's contemporary pacing and push for believable, relatable characters. Will is a veteran composer in the video game industry. He joined LucasArts as a staff composer in 2008, where he scored several games in the Star Wars universe, including Star Wars The Old Republic and Star Wars The First Assault. He later became a freelance writer, scoring Call of Duty World War II and Guild Wars II Path of Fire, among others. His scores have earned him several awards and nominations from the Game Audio Network Guild, the ASCAP, ASCAP? ASCAP. Uh, Composer's <laughs> Choice Awards, and others. Let's welcome him with a round of applause. Microphone would be better, yeah. How about this time? So, hello, I'm Will Roger, composer and music supervisor of Roger Music, and today I'll be discussing my score to Call of Duty World War II. Specifically, how my team and I approach this game as a piece of historical fiction. And before I begin, uh, I'll warn that there will be images and video clips of a graphic nature depicting and insinuating realistic violence and war. The original Call of Duty came out in 2003 at the height of the popularity of PS2-era first-person shooters. It featured fast-paced and frenetic gameplay and serious historical tone, and a more visceral presentation than competing games of the genre. And although it had a traditional orchestral score, it was unique in its extended use of dissonance and atonality to convey the chaotic action. In 2007, the franchise shocked the industry by moving uh, away from historical warfare into the present day with Call of Duty Modern Warfare. It had a much more slick and contemporary presentation, and the musical scores in this series used the Hans Zimmer influenced hybrid style that blended orchestration with synthesizer sounds and large trailer esque percussion to reinforce the new modern setting. Call of Duty entered the current generation of consoles with a series of futuristic settings changing the format once again and bringing a new style to the presentation. These game subjects featured increasingly overt use of synthesizers, much more sophisticated as well, for an even more slick and modern presentation than before. This matched both the setting with the new innovations in gameplay, uh, things like exosuits and other futuristic gear allowing faster, more vertical, and more complicated gameplay. Now for the 14th entry in the Call of Duty series, we return to the World War II setting for the first time since 2008 World War. With unmatched ferocity, Hitler's war machine has launched its blitzkrieg against Western Europe, pushing it to the brink. As we brace for our darkest hour, we must summon our strength to be the bulwark against oppression. The Nazi onslaught will be the greatest test we'll ever face. But with our allies, face it and defeat it, we must.
this day have set upon a mighty endeavor, a struggle to preserve our civilization and to set free a suffering humanity. Our sons, pride of our nation, lead them straight and cruel. Their road will be long and hard. Men's souls will be shaken with the violences of war in this hour of great sacrifice. We shall prevail. Paul. It's June 6, 1944. Wish you could see this, brother. We're invading some frog beach I'm not supposed to even know the name of. Also, we can take back France from the Nazis. But the waiting's been half the battle. Call of Duty World War II features a dark, gritty, and historically accurate setting, but with all the gameplay innovations and industry expectations of nine years and eight games worth of Call of Duty titles, not to mention a new Hollywood focus on the World War II setting in titles like the Fury, the Pacific, and of course last year's uh, Dunker. We also tell a more personal story than is typical for Call of Duty games with relatable and vulnerable characters instead of the super soldiers featured in the more recent futuristic games. For this reason, our game presented a unique problem. How can we satisfy the World War II setting and the spirit of the game faithfully while still reflecting contemporary pace in the gameplay? Our game is too modern and contemporary in its presentation for a pure traditional orchestra approach like the original Call of Duty games. The historical aspect and franchise expectations were too important for us to use overt synthesizers like Infinite Warfare or the Futuristic titles, and our story was very personal and character so an epic hybrid score like the Modern Warfare series wouldn't really work either. So this is where I am, and here's some of my other previous scores. Sledgehammer Games audio director Dave Swenson was familiar with my Laura Croft soundtrack, uh, which was traditional and orchestral, but also had some subtle sound design and electronic elements. Uh, and so I was likely hired in part because their plan was to work with the traditional composer and push them towards the modern side, rather than having a more electronic or contemporary Hollywood style composer adopt the traditional elements. The direction from the start was to be orchestra forward but refracted through contemporary presentation. We began discussing Final Mix ideas this early, even before I was officially hired. The Call of Duty series has a notoriously complicated soundscape, uh, and they were specifically looking for a score that complemented the sound design rather than fighting against it. So our music direction, therefore, rested on satisfying three pillars. First, we needed to convey the World War II setting, which I attempted through orchestration and musical sound design and other sonic sources, Next, we needed a satisfying modern feel and modern presentation that fit the evolutions of gameplay. I focused on simplicity in the writing and melodic and harmonic restraints, uh, careful, uh, careful attention to the eventual mix of in-game sound effects and subdued organic synthesis. And most importantly, we needed to portray a personal and relatable and human feel. And I have attempted this through melodic writing, the use of solo strings, and by avoiding big trailer-esque epic elements. The orchestra is at the heart of this work as my principal method of conveying the World War II setting. We recorded at Ocean Way Studios in Nashville, and I arranged the score in a traditional fashion that obeys the natural limits of live players and could have been performed without any modern innovations such as striped recording. If you're not familiar with the term, striping means recording each section of the orchestra separately. Uh, so, for example, you can record the low string separately from the high string from the brass, they're all in different takes so that you can assemble them later. Modern scores are often striped to accommodate for orchestrations that would be impossible or impractical to play all together. Uh, and although we did end up striping for reasons I'll explain later, the score still has a traditional construction that doesn't require. And as another nod to traditional scoring, I wrote identifiable themes or light motives uh, for various concepts and factions in the game. These themes are used and developed throughout the score, and melodic references are in almost every single piece. So here's a score video highlighting the six principal themes I developed.
restraint was also important for conveying the setting appropriately. We tried to make sure to preserve the World War II vibe by avoiding overtly modern elements like trade rest and percussion, or modern synth percussion in parts. And I also avoided certain orchestral sounds, like high woodwinds and brass, that might give too much of a personal period score vibe. Instead, I used a lot of solo string quartet and solo cello throughout the soundtrack, most notably in action cues, to get a lot of extra rhythm and percussive grip, uh, where you would normally use percussion or synthesis and whatnot. So here's a clip highlighting the use of solo strings within action contexts. Soundscape. 
We decided early on not to use instruments that could get in the way of gameplay uh, when mixed with voiceover or sound effects. So for example, the orchestration does not use any high winds or high breaths or pitch percussion, and especially no snare drums in the entire score. Uh, partly because they would conflict with the weapon and UI sound effects. If you think about it, a snare drum is literally just a gunshot. And partly because it would risk giving the score a cliche and very distant period piece feel, we needed it to sound up close and personal and relatable. We did have two trumpets, but they were only used to double the horns at pitch in certain loud passages. They intentionally never stand out in the mix. They don't really even have their own part. They only kind of work as like an instrumental EQ to brighten up the horn's tone uh, when we needed it. We expanded the low woodwinds and uh, brass as well for a beefy modern low end. And we used also a tuba-like synthesizer patch that I put together in silent one, if you're familiar with that music. Um, it occasionally doubles the live tuba during loud passages uh, for just more low end buzz. And sometimes it even just is used to reach lower notes that are impractical for a real tuba to play. And lastly, before turning in any of these pieces, I would play them while watching footage of the game. I would just put the music up against the footage. And if there ever was a section where either some musical element stood out or I just couldn't hear some parts of the music, I would just remove it. Another aspect of modern scoring is the use of unique signature sounds as a contemporary take on the previous Lego idea. My first signature sound was what I call the memory of war, which is basically a reverberant blur of horn calls. This represented not only our protagonist's motivations for enlistment, but also the broader concept of gamers experiencing the World War II setting uh, by playing the game. I recorded horn players performing these heroic sort of rising fifth canter gestures, which you see them, uh, completely out of time with each other. And then I layered the recordings and blurred them with filters and delays and EQ and whatnot. So here's a clip of the memory of war concept, first as we recorded it, uh, and then with process. The other signature sound I came up with is what I call the haze of war, or the reality of the war. I use music complex sound design elements within the orchestration to connect with the reality of the world which you set. This is more of like a sonic concept rather than a specific uh, individual timbre, but it was inspired by our decision not to use snare drums or mallets or typical orchestral percussion. Uh, instead, I process authentic World War II vehicle and weaponry sounds to work with musical elements. And I also used musical instruments playing non-standard techniques to sound like military sound design. So this first example will use steam releases and explosion debris and high squeaking noises from the tank uh, motion, uh, processed again with delays, filters, free reverb, and time stretching to fit within the orchestration. Uh, and then the second half of this bit we're about to play will highlight how I use train shuffling noise as a rhythmic percussion element in the main theme. Sirens and airwaves type sounds were another important signature that I used throughout the game. Uh, I used synthesizers and uh, especially electric guitar played with an emo, which is sort of like an electromagnetic kind of thing, which plays out of a uh, pick, and a brass slide and a ton of reverb to get this sort of sliding and drooping effect. Um, and then also I used a ton of brass um, effects, you know, just again drooping and sliding all over, sometimes with extra processing. Uh, to simulate the sound of distant air raid sirens.
So unusual and extended playing techniques were a big part of the score as well. Uh, in part to convey the creative setting, but also to give it a contemporary and unique vibe. So we used uh, techniques like strings over pressure, where players blow intentionally too hard and too slowly, and it gives sort of like a radio distortion effect. Uh, we use lots of aleatory orchestral techniques, which is where instead of playing together with actual rhythms, uh, players perform sort of like a blur of pitches and sounds and timbres. And lots of instances of what you might just call incorrect sound production, like, for example, having string players bow on the wrong side of the bridge, or using wooden dowels to tap the strings of the violins or the bells of the uh, trombones uh, to get sort of a percussive effect. Uh, or prelling brass by exhaling into the mouthpiece instead of buzzing the and so on. Uh, so here's a score video of one of my zombie main games uh, that uses many of the aforementioned techniques. Uh, as a sort of rhythmic 
derived from the palette. Uh, so here's just a quick example of those synths and contemporary elements. to tell a much more personal and human story than is typical for the franchise with a focus on characters and their development. I wanted to frame the score from our protagonist Daniel's point of view, so I used the dulcimer in several cues throughout, uh, representing his rural Texas upbringing. This is most overtly heard in the home screen, which is the cue we often use in cutscenes for Daniel's narrative system story. This piece will also hear reference to the memory of war concept as well as the Call of Duty signature. Sort of uh, the Call of Duty theme, 
It does use a descending fourth as its sort of main outline motive, but the idea is to make sure that the allies themselves have a very fragile cause, uh, much more personal and human with the much shorter range. We recorded the score at Ocean Way Studios, which is a storage stage that fits a full orchestra, uh, but is relatively small and allows for a lot of sonic detail. We mixed it with much less added reverb than is typical, uh, aimed for a tighter, closer, and more intimate and aggressive sound rather than a grand epic tone. One thing I don't think a lot of people realize is that when you record in a place like Abbey Road or Air, which already has a huge room and lots of reverb just naturally, uh, it's still quite typical for a uh, mix engineer to add some Procasti M7 or less uh, just to give it that even more epic sound. Well, we minimize that quite as much as possible. Um, again, this greatly helps serve our up close and gritty aesthetic. The music sounds like you're inside the conflict rather than viewing it from a distance. And lastly, I explore the concept of writing melodies with as few syllables as possible. These are pieces of music that are aggressively stripped down uh, so that what remains carries the simple emotional honesty that's needed for a game that takes place in a real historical setting. Uh, the, most overt, uh, the most overt example of this was in the Burger level, where our protagonist searched through a recently abandoned concentration camp. So here's a score and a video from that scene. Thinking, 
too much about the big picture. In Call of Duty World War II, it was a combination of both. Uh, action and stealth cues primarily was for in the first person, with moments of high tension and uh, just the idea of combat readiness uh, sprinkled throughout the action pieces. Some of the most important scenes, however, such as April mentioned the burger level, uh, were scored in the third person. And they were more like a broad commentary on the setting as a whole. So in this final section, I'll discuss my process for writing the main theme, uh, which served as a palette for the score as a whole. Uh, cohesion and uniqueness are of the utmost importance of modern scores, so we spent a good amount of time focusing only on perfecting the main theme. I did three complete rewrites before we settled on a final direction. My first attempt combined sort of a standard traditional orchestra with some fairly overt modern synths.
Some of the revisions were still needed, but this was a good starting point. Our first section, the melody needed to be more focused and use less syllables, uh, so I reduced it to be as simple as possible. I also changed the horn solo to uh, cello to get a more fragile human feel for the Atlas theme. The big epic drum sounded a little too trailery and impersonal, so I used the aforementioned Musi Complex percussion elements instead. Uh, our audio director suggested that uh, the lead-in into the chorus sounded too clean, uh, so I embraced more grit and darkness there while adding dissonances and the dirty swell. And lastly, I tried to tell a story using the form of the piece. Uh, it starts off with a desperate pause with this solo cello, but then it breaks into the heroic melody for the Call of Duty theme, uh, which grows and grows, symbolizing people answering the call and accomplishing a heroic feat. So to wrap things up, here's a score video of the final main theme. Because my background was very classical and traditional, Call of Duty World War II was uniquely challenging for me in that I needed to adopt contemporary scoring production and processes in order to best underscore the presentation and pacing of the game and make sure that it felt relatable and real. And I accepted my traditionalism and expanded on it instead of trying to assimilate the Hollywood sound of the franchise and played to my own strengths of orchestration and melody rather than attempting to rely entirely on modern elements like synthesis and percussion. But ultimately, I realized that even in historical fiction, you don't need to be completely bound to the sonic stereotypes of the setting for it to be effective. Both the Sledgehammer CEO and the senior music supervisor at Sony gave me the same exact advice. Focus on writing music for all of Call of Duty, and don't worry too much about the specific setting of this game. As long as the vibe is correct, players will draw their own connections. And that's it. I'd like to thank everyone at the IGDA. Uh, thanks to Constance and uh, all the people who have helped me speak here. Thanks to HBO for uh, this space, and of course, thanks to Sledgehammer Games for 
inviting me on this incredible project, and thanks to you for coming to this session.
again, I wanted it to not sound like big and epic. Um, I wanted to have a fragility to it. I wanted it to be almost as simple as possible. Um, so it, you know, once we had the sort of main theme dialed down, I kind of said, you know what, there really didn't need to be vocals in here. So does there really need to be anything vocal in the rest of the score? Um, the only candidate, I guess, that uh, I ever thought about bringing vocals back was the burger level. Um, but even still, you know, I, I had to re reboot that into maybe once or twice as well. And both times it was like, nah, let's not do something that sounds too like distant or like it's like, it's like a documentary. It has to sound like you're actually there. It has to sound much more basic and, and simple and, 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 and heartfelt. It's almost like, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm dead serious. It's literally just like three notes on a keyboard. Like, you know, like a, a four-year-old could play this piece. But that's kind of what we needed was that very raw emotion. So, um, yeah, that's that's why in this game at least um, there was there was no. Um, uh, first of all, thank you for uh, coming and talking about your music. It was really cool to get into your head, yeah, like that. Um, well, my question is: did, Was there anything during the whole production process that surprised you? Uh, I know there is some. Like we were talking about like, removing your composer self for, for that. Did you have to do that for the rest of the game? Or there's some sometimes when the producers were like, I want this thing complete, a completely different you didn't think about. You know, that sort of stuff. Yeah, just about every night I went to bed crying, you know, thinking I would be fired. Um, I wish I was joking, but I'm really not. <laughs> uh, no, it's 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 you know a multi-billion dollar franchise game. Many leaps of magnitude greater than anything else that I've um, written before in terms of just the pressure. But I would also say that the main pressure that I have on this title is just the fact that it's a game I've wanted to score for like 15 years. Um, you can like I, I carry around a pocket book, and I always have one of these. And this is actually you can't see it, but it's all like sheet music, and I you know do tons of sketching like all the time. You know I've got dozens of these uh, since since college, and I've written so many sort of like Medal of Honor, Call of Duty sort of uh, model compositions, you could say. Um, because I loved that series, you know, throughout college, Michael Chikino being the original composer. And, uh, you know, when it came to this game, then suddenly it's like, oh crap, it's my turn. I can, like, do this now? What do I do? And you know, I looked through almost every one of those. And I guess the biggest surprise of all was that none of it was viable. This is a totally different game uh, than those original those original Call of Duty's were. This is much more personal. It's, I mean, you, you look at it now, you look at the, the screenshot, and it just seems like regular people with like, you know, regular you know, 2017 accents. You know, everyone just seems like normal dudes that you could just see wherever. And that was the whole point. So it needed to be something completely different from uh, the established sound. And of course I loved, because you know, that's what they grew up with. But, um, I would say that's probably the biggest surprise of all is that so, None of that was viable. I suppose actually the biggest surprise is that I got hired in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, first of all, um, getting fired is the worst thing in the world. <laughs> um, so I have two questions for you. Who's laughing? Uh, <laughs> how do you feel about uh, Rubato sections for the forms, uh, not just the retard at the end of something, but Rubato in the middle of phrases as a production. Like, how would you go about doing that? And, and did, you, did you think about that? And, and was there any problems with it? And my second part of my question is, how do you, since you didn't get to necessarily work out the implementation of the music, how do you feel if they implemented it? And do you wish you had a little more input into that, or did you have enough? I'm actually going to answer these in reverse order because the second one gives some insight into the first. Uh, I had almost, in fact, pretty much no insight into the implementation. That was all the Sony team. Um, it was all they're doing. Uh, and that actually was well, not problematic because I think they did a wonderful job. They've been doing this for what, 20, 30 years. But um, it was difficult because the previous scores that I've done were things like Lara Croft, where they literally gave me a PC. And they said, knock yourself out, here's Perforce, here's our engine, and you know, do whatever you want. 
And I love that because I could do things like I could play through the game and get stuck on some level because I suck at video games. And I would know, all right, well, if people suck at video games, then they're going to be stuck here. It needs another cube. So I would write another cube and I would do that. Um, but in this case, it was kind of up to the Sony team to make those types of decisions, um, which is risky. But at the same time, the way that we produce uh, music for this and the way that the Sony team works, uh, again, because they often work with people outside of the game industry, like film composers and whatnot, um, we didn't write to the metal. Instead, I wrote those suites and whatnot, where they can just edit from that to get whatever they want. And um, in the end, it worked out when you play the game, and um, you know, it always feels like it's very custom scored, but in reality, you know, I hadn't even seen half the levels when I was actually writing music. Um, but this brings us back to the first point, which is that because everything was so aggressively stemmed, and because every suite of music I had written needed to be reused over and over and over again, we couldn't take too many liberties with things like you know, performing it to stick or whatnot. Um, you know, I love. Uh, you, you hear this more in a, for some reason you hear this more in Japanese scores than in American ones, but. There's lots of gorgeous moments in game music where it's, been, it's recorded entirely in stick, uh, without any you know fancy stemming or, or click tracks or anything. But it's just let's very naturally perform this like it's a piece of like real music, quote unquote. Um, and it, it sounds gorgeous. But um, when you need to do a lot with it, when you have like so much that you have to mix together and all these stems and all these prelays and whatnot, uh, it, it kind of falls apart if you do that. I can only think of one instance where. This is on an unreleased Star Wars game, but um, we had the first half of it just recorded as is. And this is London Symphony Orchestra, too. And then the second half of the piece, and it's only like two minutes long, was like all done to stick from the final mix edit. Uh, and that's literally it. That's the only time I've ever gotten away with uh, using Rubato. Um, but it's a wonderful technique that um, I hope that we can find ways in the future to make it work um, with this sort of function. But um, great question. Thank you. So you used a lot of different orchestration techniques to pull emotion out of this. You know, I hear elements of Horner and Zimmer, and just all kinds of cool compositional elements. But get, judging by what you're just saying there about uh, the Sony team grabbing all your stuff and kind of pulling it apart and throwing it together, were you pleased, I guess, emotionally with what they came up with? I mean, you came up with a lot of ideas in the core instructors and the, the stuff that was there and orchestrated here and whatnot between you and your orchestrator, but then they would pull that apart even further and create essentially their own versions of your work. So was there ever, um, I guess what I'm getting at, was, was there ever a, a disconnect between sort of your intention, what you wanted, and what they came up with? I mean, it is your work, but it's, it's their realization of your idea. The answer to that is yes, but only in positive ways. I mean, there would be times where I've written, you know, like a thematic piece that just so happened to have like a section of some of that music complete idea um, in the middle, and then like, okay, I go off into the back of the melody or whatever. And they take that little bit and then score an entire section of a level with it. And you know, I was always super impressed by you know how they were able to do that. Um, again, it was it's very aggressively stemmed. Uh, so they would, especially with the percussion and, and all of these different um, kind of sound designing techniques. Uh, so they did have a lot of freedom to come up with that. But um, it's, you know, I, I gotta say that it was nice working with them instead of trying to compete against them this time. Because <laughs> I spent a lot of my career trying to go up against the people who had done, you know, God of War and, and Uncharted and, and trying to compete against a team of like 30 people who were working on this. So it's nice to actually have them on my side. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, they, they have so much experience with putting these things together and just kind of drawing out um, of the original material and also guiding me in ways to compose that are not really natural to me personally. I wouldn't have made those choices, but they just kind of assured me, like, no, trust us, like, it's actually going to work really well if you write it this way. Um, so I would do that, and then that meant that they had the freedom to you know, uh, just come up with way more content uh, in ways that I would never have thought of. Thank you. Let's give Will another round of applause. And a big thank you to HBO for letting us use their lovely space.
questions, but we ask that everyone is out by 9 o'clock.